evening and welcome to the second episode of season two of our live chat session by Outdoor Wilderness and Learning, Owl in Short. Owl conducts curated speaker sessions and insightful workshops with trainers and facilitators around leadership, management, innovation, and public speaking. Owl also serves as a platform for eminent speakers and facilitators. We have partnered with domain experts who are highly experienced trainers and facilitators to help organizations win in the marketplace. Today, India is on the cusp of a revival. She's battling her way out of the dark days of April and May, moving into a visibly well-lit July. As adults, we have battled our own demons over the last 16 months. Frontline workers have battled it out from the trenches. The rest have fought through the fog from their homes. But in all of this, how have our children fared? 16 months of their normal childhood has been robbed. What scars will they carry with them as they grow up? They may be smiling and laughing every day, but are they really happy? Will they grow up as weak, unsure, frightened adults? Or will they be strong and resilient? Our topic for the day is raising healthy, resilient children, pandemic and beyond. And only a doctor who has worked in the trenches with children, many of them undergoing treatment for cancer, can answer these questions and guide us with objectivity and empathy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome a dear friend and renowned pediatric oncologist, Dr. Shantanu Sen on our Aul Chat today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Avik. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's uh, really nice of you guys to invite me here to be with you on this platform. And I'm really looking forward to our session today. Absolutely, uh, Shantanu. So let me tell, you, uh, tell the audience a little more about uh, who Dr. Sen is. He heads the Pediatric Stem Cell Transplantation Program at Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Amani Hospital, KDH for short, in Mumbai. He has over 30 plus years of experience in pediatric oncology and bone marrow transplantation, BMT. He's the only internationally accredited BMT unit inspector in India, a teacher and examiner for the Royal College of Pediatrics UK. He has been chosen as one of the top doctors in Mumbai in 2019 and 2020. He's an examiner of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health UK and, and an Indian Icon Award winner in 2015. So good evening and welcome to our show, Shantanu. And thank you so much for taking time out from your busy schedule to talk to us today. And before you say anything, let me wish you and all the doctors around the world and in your hospital in India, a very, very happy Doctor's Day, because I believe today is uh, National Doctor's Day. It is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, actually. And uh, really appreciate all that you've said. That's really very, very kind of you. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, always kind of like uh, when I'm kind of sitting with you across a table or chatting, and that's, I think, the best way to talk about any subject that we have. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. Same here, Shantanu. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Uh, you have studied medicine in the UK and you've practiced in the NHS for over 10 years before returning to India and starting the Pediatric Stem Cell Transplantation Program at KDH in Mumbai. Uh, what made you return to India? Yeah, that's a very good question. And to be honest, uh, I, I think there are times when I myself ask myself that question and say, okay, what exactly kind of persuaded me? To be honest, uh, I think what happens is that if you are away from your country for any length of time, you get that uh, you get the feeling that there should be a return to your own roots. You want to come back to where you are. Uh, like you say, your motherland kind of calls you. So that certainly was the feeling with me. And then again, what happens is that uh, when you're in UK, we're in US, wherever, uh, the family ties are something that you tend to treasure. And in some way, you want your children to actually have that kind of advantage of reconnecting with grandparents, having the advantage of having the entire extended family together. And I think all of those factors kind of put together and gave me the opportunity to come back to India when I did. And to be honest, I don't regret it even for a minute. I think it's been a wonderful experience working here uh, in India, in Mumbai, and with Coke 11 Hospital. Fabulous. Your team is also credited with uh, conducting the youngest 
thalassemia transplant in India at nine months. And uh, they've also transplanted the smallest baby in the world, uh, transplanted for neuroblastoma at the age of four months is what I hear. As laymen, uh, we kind of only look at doctor's qualifications. All right. Uh, we say, oh, this is a great doctor. So let's go to him. But I'm sure there's a very uh, well-oiled machinery that must be working behind the scene to help carry out such complex procedures. So how important, Shantanu, is teamwork in your uh, department? I, I think you've, you've actually hit the nail on the head. To be honest, uh, none of the work that we do, either in treating uh, children with cancer or doing stem cell transplant or uh, kind of doing innovative treatment to kind of give a new lease of life to all our patients, none of it would be possible if we did not have the fantastic team that we have here. And it's a team that we had put together over the last 10 years. And what's happened now, we really work together like a well-oiled machinery. To be honest, sometimes I feel that my role there is kind of in, a, in some instances, a little bit minor. It's only when we put together hard work that's been put in by our nurses, who really are the ones that are looking after the kids 24 seven. My interaction with the children and their parents might be for 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes maybe. The rest of the 23 and a half hours, the nurses are looking after those kids. They are fabulous, they are fantastic. They're sometimes undervalued and they're the most important parts of our team. But together with that, we have all the rest of our team members. We have fantastic service from our blood bank. And I am quite proud to say that we probably have one of the best blood bank services that exists, to be honest, in our country. We have our infectious disease experts, all our great people who work in the labs and then even outside. And it's when you actually put everybody together, working with each other with great communication, in a friendly work environment, that's when you can deliver the results that you really want to deliver. That's when you have the fabulous outcomes, the children getting better, they're going home back to their families, diseases getting cured, transplant success. So really the key word in it all is great teamwork, working together, friendly work atmosphere, and that's what really makes a huge difference. Absolutely, because uh, most of your procedures are extremely complex. Obviously, they're all life-saving uh, procedures that you do. And uh, to acknowledge the nurses uh, at this point in time, considering what they have been going through over the last uh, 18 months, so I'm sure that will come as a huge uh, boost for them if they're hearing this uh, or viewing this uh, session today. I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, sometimes we feel that uh, when you <clears throat> go to a nursing home or a hospital, you go there to be with the doctor, but... To be honest, when you are there, I mean, uh, and I know you've been on the other side, yeah, you had uh, been admitted for something, but if you are a patient anywhere, any nursing or any hospital, you'll find that it's the nurses. They really are the lifeblood of our profession. They are the ones that really makes a difference anyway. Uh, so the, another question that I've been wanting to ask you is that uh, during the initial days of the pandemic, uh, how tough was it for you and your team working with children, some of whom obviously are suffering from or rather right. undergoing treatment for cancer, uh, considering that after lockdown was announced abruptly, everything came to a standstill. So obviously, many of your patients undergo BMT uh, treatment uh, uh, and lots of other treatment which cannot stop, including right. international patients who, were, who regularly come, into, uh, come to uh, the hospital. So lives were already at stake and then the pandemic and the subsequent lockdown. How quickly did you work out a new SOP and what major challenges did you face uh, while working those things out considering you hardly had time to prepare for something like this? I, it's, a, it's a very good question because initially in the initial days of 2020, March, April, when suddenly the lockdown was announced, we really didn't know what to expect. We didn't know how long the lockdown would last. We didn't know what services would be available. We didn't know what's going to happen. I mean, we were kind of looking into a crystal ball like just like anybody else. So at that point of time, um, we kind of took a pragmatic decision to say that let's stop uh, planned operations, planned transplants, and only focus on life-saving transplants. So, I mean, the ones where if we did, did not go ahead and perform a transplant urgently, 
that patient may not be around three months from now. And there were lots of difficulties. There were difficulties like a patient, say, for example, a, a patient who is in Chhattisgarh who was meant to come in, suddenly the lockdown happens. There's no mode of traveling. And we knew that if that kid did not come to us, we will not be able to help him because the services certainly were not there in the part of the country that he is. And um, then what happened was he decided to actually drive down. And then we coordinated with a lot with the government, with the police organizations to say that, give this guy, he's coming here for life-saving operations. He should have a kind of uh, special permissions all throughout to come in. Uh, it took us a few weeks to actually work out all the complexities that we needed to work together. And we developed new ways of working. We developed new partnerships. We realized that we need to work with our colleagues who are in the community to do a lot of work that could be done closer to home. We made arrangements for parents to stay back in the hospital when needed. And uh, we tried to make sure that uh, we provided the best service. It was challenging, but go forward a couple of months with that was sometime in mid April, which when we realized that we are looking at this for the long haul, rather than the short uh, four weeks, two weeks, six weeks, we didn't worry. So that's when we kind of realized that the, the recurrence of this lockdown is going to be quite long. Yes. That essential services cannot stop. If you have a cancer, we need to treat. We cannot wait for when the lockdown eases. And that's when we actually started to work out, get those patients into the hospital, put them up, start them on treatment, get them on the pathway to care as soon as possible. So what about the children uh, who would come from uh, outside India for treatment? How, how, how did you manage that? Because I believe even international uh, uh, travel was completely off the charts. So Absolutely. how did you manage to treat them? So that really was a massive challenge, to be honest. And to be honest, uh, I think I speak to the rest of my colleagues across India as well. The whole uh, uh, patients coming in from outside, be it in the Middle East, elsewhere, really stopped down to a trickle simply because there were very few flights that were coming in. And... Uh, I think it was only about 5% of the patients that managed to get an emergency flight and emergency permission to come in. And uh, we did have one or two patients who managed to get special permission both from there and, and again from the authorities out here to be able to catch one of those flights and come in. But seriously, during those first about four to six months, it had really stopped. To be fair, to be honest, even now, you know that the international flights still are have not started. So what has to, what what is going on right now is the air bubble arrangements, which is really for absolutely essential travel and medical treatment wise visas are not really being given that much. So even now it's been really very very slow. I think at the moment we just wait to see what happens in the future when the pandemic eases a little bit air travel eases up and hopefully hopefully that should happen soon and we should be seeing yes a change yes, yes. because i mean one of the news that's come in today is that uh, apart from switzerland a lot of other countries have uh, announced that they will uh, accept uh, the covishield, uh, COVID-shield vaccine uh, as one of the things germany estonia uh, so i think, there I is, think uh, switzerland Spain, germany S switzerland has already said they will even issue uh, uh, tourist visas mm. but mm. Uh, the other countries have at least in principle announced that they will accept uh, we just need to see how they're going to go around uh, uh, working around the consulates opening as well as uh, uh, issuing Absolutely. visas. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, okay. So uh, before we carry on, uh, viewers, I just want to tell you that you need to keep posting your questions in the YouTube chat uh, and Dr. Sen will be happy to take them, uh, uh, take each of your questions towards the end of this uh, program. So just type in whatever comes to your mind. If there is some burning issue that uh, you want answered, uh, he's the right person. Okay, so That's Shantanu, right. yeah. uh, how did your little patients react to the whole situation? And uh, what's the kind of advice uh, uh, that you gave them at the time of the lockdown and still do, uh, especially even to their parents to help them navigate this massive crisis? Uh, uh, because looking at it, you know, they were already dealing with a massive crisis in their personal lives. And then there was this pandemic that kind of, uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, uh, struck them. And right. the first line, first person they would have turned to is you. So mm-hmm. what is the advice that you gave to such parents and the children? So at that point of time, uh, and it's probably true even today, the knowledge that we had is that this is a virus that spread by close proximal contact between affected and unaffected, which means that we all kind of like advise that really, really stay at home socially, keep your distance, social distancing as much as possible, hand hygiene, masks, etc. But it also, as you rightly said, it means that with the schools had to be shut down, the kids were at home, so their usual education couldn't happen. And gradually the transition happened when uh, kids started uh, attending online classes. Yes. Their usual uh, school friendships and play area and going down to play with friends, that had stopped and they were at home. So what we kept on saying to the parents is that uh, there's a lot they can do to actually encourage the kids to kind of organize their time so that, yes, they will need to attend classes, do online uh, education, and that's important. But it's also important to have a little bit of social side to it, a little bit of play activity. And that's whether that's play activity with the family, family members, parents, have a me time there, indulge in a little bit of board games. And also really, really important because what we have seen now as we are, as you say, coming out of the pandemic, that this whole lockdown has had a lot of effects on the kids, to be honest. And uh, it has had effects uh, on nutrition. We've uh, seen uh, both undernutrition and a lot of kids gaining a lot of weight, which might be because families are together and you're all experimenting with uh, making bread at home or whatever, which is great. But that also meant that you kind of like you order a lot of food from outside and the kids, we've had an epidemic of obesity among children here in the city. It's seriously an epidemic. And I know for a fact that there is also an epidemic of undernutrition that's happening when you look at a different strata of society where the pandemic has led to loss of jobs, loss of employment uh, with uh, kind of money becoming short food becoming scarce and children have actually suffered a lot from that. We've seen problems with uh, education. You are delivering an online education and that is through mobile phones, televisions, laptops, whatever. And it means that as a corollary to that, they are getting so much of of, uh, their education on an electronic media based platform it is just so easy to go into a mobile addiction, into an electronic media addiction, and that is bad. Because I remember, which is quite funny, that if I go back about uh, three years, 2018, 2019, I would be telling parents, make sure you limit the electronic media exposure to you of your children to about 45 minutes to an hour. And That's, that's what you told us. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> Exactly. We kind of said 45 minutes. That's what we say. Don't let them go out and play. And then suddenly we are in an era where they are probably sitting in front of the screens for four hours or six hours at a stretch. And that's schoolwork and that's social interaction with their friends and which which is needed. I mean, they need some Zoom sessions which are not moderated by the teachers to chat among themselves. And then again, they are looking at uh, Netflix and uh, all the other diversions that are there because what else are true? And that worries me. That worries me because if that much of attention is on an electronic uh, screen all the time, that's a worry that we'll have to deal with. There is so, also, uh, yeah, please, yeah. sorry. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the worry that, uh, which, which I have that if they are really sitting in front of, see- of their screens for such a long time, I have worries about unsupervised uh, access to the net, inappropriate access to sites that should not be accessed by children, and whether within their own social groups, there might be instances of bullying that we don't know about. These are all worries that we had. So Shantanu, you uh, mentioned uh, electronic addiction. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what are some of the telltale signs of uh, a child 
you know, not uh, uh, of a child being addicted to uh, the uh, the electronic uh, media. And uh, what are some of the symptoms we should be very, very wary of? And the first things that the child is in trouble. So what are some of those signs that we as parents uh, mm -hmm. should be looking out for? I think uh, parents will be the best ones to pick up when something's not quite right with their kids. And sometimes it can be difficult. But uh, if you suddenly find that your child's behavior, their demeanor, the way the child's kind of uh, talking or behaving has changed. So uh, a normally talkative child is becoming very quiet or seems to be inappropriately morose or sad or withdrawn, then you worry what's happening. If you're looking at whether the child's getting more and more addicted, so if the child has the mobile phone on all the time, either playing video games or even while, say, having the meals, kind of looking at the screen, that's something you need to be worried about. And what would really tell you that this is becoming a problem is that if you tell the child to shut up the screen or leave the mobile phone and then let's talk, he finds it incredibly difficult to either switch it off or he puts it down and after five minutes finds the excuse to pick it up and switch it on again, then you know, right, I will need to do something about this. This is getting to a point where I'll have to do, I'll have to impose my authority as a parent and say that let's cut it down just that little bit. True. Uh, so another worry is that, I mean, it's, it's 17 months into it. Had it been just one or two months, it would have just been maybe a little bit of a practice. But with 17 yeah. months, it's going to be part of their DNA now, not even a habit. It's going to be part of their DNA that uh, uh, it's, it's part of their lives. Almost seven, eight hours, uh, if not more, they are, they, are, they are watching the screen. So uh, mm. is there some kind of uh, fear that these will be scars that they are going to grow up with? And maybe a smiling child, which is something that I mentioned earlier also, they may be smiling and laughing, but are they really happy? And uh, one of the most important questions that I want to ask you is that will all of this, that all the time you're talking about pandemic and, you know, don't go out, wear your mask, etc. We are frightening them for the last 17 months. So are they going to grow up as weak, unsure, frightened adults, or will they be strong and resilient? So that's uh, one of the things we wanted to ask you. Yeah. I think I think I have my trust in the kids. I have my trust in the family values that we install in our children. Uh, if you look at it this way, the kids are with their parents, and you are all bonding together in a way that the families probably have not bonded together before this. Sure. And I I have my trust that they will be resilient. They will overcome it because kids are remarkably resilient. They bounce back from the humongous, hugest uh, adversities that you put in their place and they bounce back and become normal. And I'm sure that's going to happen to the kids as well. And we can actually see that happening now. We see that that when the, when the lockdown's gradually opening and the kids are reconnecting with their friends and going out to, as they are a little bit with their friends with maybe it's a small <coughs> party <coughs> or a get together, they are bouncing back. They are like normal. And I think there are, there, are, there are a few positive things. Yes, as you say, that they've been all been shut down for such a long time. But I would be hoping that that would have taught them some good values as well, the good lessons as well. I'm hoping they would have be all kind of like treasuring those moments of family time that's together. Parents will be bonding with the children. Kids will be bonding with the siblings and getting together, working together realizing family values, realizing a uh, work culture, because uh, I'm hoping that they would have been uh, involved more in helping out their parents with a little bit of housework. So those are very positive lessons to learn. Sure. And hopefully they would have realized that uh, with all of us, like we are in the Zoom meeting, talking to each other and spreading the message across the globe, that we are all learned, we are learning and we've learned that none of us are actually working in isolation. We are all part of this humongous global village that we are together. And those are, I think, important uh, life lessons to take away from this. So really, I think Absolutely. they will grow up to be strong kids. Um, well, I don't know about uh, children, 
but we adults are also getting very stressed out with this uh, three worded sentence which is being thrown at us from all sides it's called the third wave okay so there's huge concern uh, as the media is carrying the news that it's going to impact children hugely uh, but we were also listening to dr guleria the other day of aims and he said that there is no scientific evidence to suggest that the third wave will hit the children what is your belief to be absolutely honest i will go out on a limb and say i think nobody has an idea so let's look at where it comes from we know when the first wave came it kind of affected the uh, the advanced age people the older people much more and we said that we needed to protect the 60 plus and the 65 plus because that was the demographic that was the age that got the most severe brunt of it so kind of a slightly senior population with comorbidities which was what we saw but that was when the second wave came, I, I mean, it was a surprise. It was a surprise, as you know, because we didn't expect, we thought that we had all developed an immunity to it. And then it hit us like a sledgehammer. And we noted that the ones that were getting most severely affected was no longer the, the 65 plus population, but was actually the 40 plus or even the 20 plus and the 25 plus. And they were the ones that were quite surprisingly to us. I mean, yes, I think the medical team, the whole medical fraternity also were a little bit caught on the back foot when they saw that this is the younger aged population who really had no comorbidities. They were not hypertensive, diabetic. They were reasonably active, led healthy lifestyles, uh, exercise fanatics, and they are the ones that are getting affected. So kind of you draw a corollary to that and say that if and when the third wave comes, it's going to affect the younger children much more. There's another factor that leads us to say that, which is, of course, we kind of hope and we believe that vaccination is our way out of this epidemic. Sure. And uh, very rightly, the initial vaccination strategy has been vaccinating the slightly elder age group population, and then we've been starting to vaccinate the 18 plus. But the pragmatic and the practical difficulty is that we do not have a vaccine for the kids as of yet here in India. Now, uh, thankfully, the trials are on with uh, a co-vaccine in the 12 to 18 and even to the 2 to 12 age group. But as we speak today, we don't have a vaccine for children. I mean, US and UK has, the Pfizer vaccine has been licensed from 12 to 18, and pretty soon it might be licensed from 2 plus. But if and when the epidemic hits, our kids would not be, have the advantage of being vaccinated against it. So th these are worries we have. But whether it really is going to hit, when it's going to hit, how bad it's going to be, to be honest, really is anybody's guess. But it's good to be prepared. It's always good to think the worst. And if it doesn't happen, that's fantastic. So then what's your uh, advice to parents? What should we do? Uh, the third wave they are saying is as early as August, September. So right. what is it that, what are some of the precautions that we as parents should take uh, mm -hmm. for these uh, children? I, I'm glad you asked that because uh, that, that helps me address another actually issue that has arisen from the uh, pandemic and the isolation. social, well, the fact that we've all been strapped up in their homes for the last two years, which means for uh, a lot of children, I have a worry that uh, parents, especially for young kids, um, because of their worry about exposure, they have let uh, lapse their vaccinations to quite a lot. So which means that there's been a lot of kids who, where, whose essential vaccines like uh, measles, mums, rubella, chicken pox, pox, et cetera. So they haven't had those vaccinations on time. And we are seeing it now. I'm very glad to say that that awareness has actually filtered through because now I'm getting a lot of uh, parents actually calling me up and saying that, you know what, uh, his vaccination was due last year in March. We did. Can we come now and do it? And please do that. Please make sure you catch up with your kids' essential life-saving vaccinations right now. If, and if you missed it about a year back or six months back, doesn't matter. Catch up with that. There's also a bit of an advice saying that if you have young children, it is a good idea to give them the advantage of giving them an influenza vaccine. 
parents ask me, will the influence of vaccine protect them against COVID? And the answer is no, it will not, but it will protect them against seasonal flu. And to be very honest, uh, over the last two to three weeks, what we have seen, which is extremely interesting, is that uh, children, adults, we are seeing a lot of flu. We are seeing seasonal flu, influenza A, influenza B, uh, uh, RSV. These flu infections are starting to appear in a huge number, which wasn't the case about a year ago. We've also seen a lot of children, a lot of children coming in with dengue fever. Last year, we didn't. We've seen a lot of children coming in malaria. So which means for parents, going back to basics, Make sure you vaccinate your kids well. General uh, kind the of- The normal like, vaccinations which they're absolutely. supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Keeping the society clean, stop, uh, stop mosquitoes breeding, and catch up with vaccinations. And then hopefully we have already taught them the importance of hand hygiene, uh, mask, distance. All of that should, should, should be well-placed to help them. So Shantanu, we saw what the second wave did and how it caught us unawares in terms of preparation, government, uh, the, the local administration, uh, uh, even us as uh, citizens of India. It, it just kind of caught us totally unawares. All right. Now with so much of uh, talk about the third wave, etc. Has the infrastructure now, do you think as a doctor, you uh, the infrastructure in your hospital and in hospitals around India, BMC or whatever you want to call it, their entire infra is now geared up to handle a third wave. Should it in any way be as big as the second wave that's going to come, especially when it comes to children? Because now we are only talking about pediatric uh, uh, care uh, because it's children. So are we really geared up for that now? I, I think one of the good things that uh, will come out of this pandemic is that the second wave taught us the importance of being prepared. And thankfully, I'm happy to say that that's actually happening. That's happening at all levels. It's happening at a government level where pediatric departments are being set up, which can tackle and take a huge number of children should they need to get admitted. It's happening at uh, tertiary hospitals like ours, where each and every department is setting aside dedicated areas where a large number of children can be admitted and treated. And it's happening at grassroots levels as well. And I say it's a good thing to come out because that's a fantastic development. Because all that funding that's coming into setting up these children's services will strengthen the health care being provided to children in the long run. Because if we have a district hospital or a, a smaller general hospital, which has set up a separate area for kids, it becomes so much easier to continue that and it be able to provide healthcare services for kids in the long run. So short run, yes, it's there. We are all prepared to deal with it if and when it hits. And in the long run, it will be there for healthcare for children if and when they need it. Okay, so I have two more questions before we move on to the audience. And I can see quite a few questions coming in from there as well. All right. Uh, so as an optimist, can we suggest uh, that the pandemic may after all be a catalyst for progress in children? I mean, look at the brighter things, uh, brighter side of things. Uh, uh, we are spending, as you said, we are spending quality time uh, 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 with our kids. Uh, they are learning stuff like Roblox and coding, yeah. etc., uh, uh, maybe they are wiring themselves into being very astute uh, beings and we are not aware of that. So yeah, uh, do you think that it's kind of, uh, they will be very progressive children going forward? Is that something that you're seeing as a... Uh, I think they're going to be remarkably resilient children, to be very honest. They're going to be very tech savvy. Uh, let's be honest. They have learned more about tech and as a robot plots and Absolutely. learning new languages Absolutely. and coding. Uh, dealing with technology uh, day in, day out, and that's going to be the future. They, they have learned it already, how to, how to use the technology to, uh, I mean, I've seen kids uh, uh, getting in touch uh, with their friends and watching movies together. I, I think they're going to be amazing. They're going to be really amazing. They're going to really harness the power of the uh, internet and the technology to make sure they're going to face a brave new world. 
very reassuring word shantanu uh, to hear that coming from, i mean coming from you that's uh, that's uh, going to make a lot of parents sleep a little easy uh, tonight uh, so one more thing one of my favorite subjects travel uh, so we're taking children out to the outdoors away from crowded places maybe on a hike or a camping trip etc restore some balance uh, in the way that, that we are kind of looking at their upbringing right now i uh, think that is essential that is absolutely essential because uh, unless you do that uh, uh, there's this thing we say the earth is healing and i mean to be honest that's kind of a fantastic side effect of the lockdown the air we breathe is fresher pollution is down the nature has healed itself the, the grass really is greener out there and i think we owe it to our children to take them out and show them the that side of nature as soon as possible when this when the circumstances allows us to do that and we should do that we really need to do that take them away from the mobile and the tv screens for some time and explore the great outdoors which is out there that would be such a good thing for every parent to do absolutely absolutely and in fact uh, in uh, i mean there are such lovely places to go to even in india right now because the rest of the world maybe you cannot go but with the monsoons coming in the rest of maharashtra is looking beautiful so uh, parents can easily take them out on these day trips uh, somewhere in the midst of nature and come back so it's a bit of a healing touch maybe absolutely you need to just drive up towards nasik or somewhere and you see the green scenery absolutely. over there it's gorgeous absolutely okay so ladies and gentlemen as we do uh, with each of our sessions uh, we usually come to this point where we start taking in the audience questions and uh, so shantanu uh, there are quite a few audience questions that have come in and i don't know if i have time for all of them but i'll take up a few but before i take up the ones that have come in the first one that came in yesterday a friend of mine sanjeev goel he said start the session with this question which is right. he wants to know when is the earliest that children should be able to go to school i think he's he's getting his hands full of children at home so, <laughs> so what would your advice according to you if you are looking into the future what do you think when is the earliest we can send our kids to school uh Okay, so I might be treading on a few toes when I say that, but I have to say not now. We, I'm saying not now because we have a great unknown quantity, an unknown factor in front of us, which is this whole uh, third wave, whether it hits or doesn't hit. To me, it makes more sense that after we vaccinate at least a significant proportion of our adult population. so as to stop the spread of virus to a certain degree we should be thinking of actually opening up the schools i'm not going to uh, advocate that we vaccinate our children against covid before doing that but at least we should have some uh, some markers some indication to say that the virus is not spreading as much in the community as before before we start opening up schools put a pin down a number to that as to when it would happen i think we are probably looking at to see whether this third wave hits us august september october and if it doesn't and if we find that we are pretty okay then i think the start of the new year is probably going to be pragmatically the time that things will happen uh, if it happens earlier say in august in october and november i'd be happy let's see i think yeah, you and i will find out very difficult i don't have a crystal ball and neither has anybody else on the planet so you're saying another 6 months before i uh, think so. see them in school i all think right. so all right okay so let's take the first question from the audience uh, the first one is with academics going completely online what's your advice on handling children with adhd they just don't seem to focus on online classes uh uh it's a, it's a very very real problem uh and to be honest we have had um uh, kids coming in and parents bringing in because online classes means that not only they can't handle uh we've seen that uh, quite a few kids in whom the diagnosis would not have been made kind of coming to the forefront so uh the only way i mean there's a good way to deal with uh, with the problem that you have is that the access to services which are things like uh, occupational therapy a little bit of learning therapy these services have also kind of moved online to a certain degree 
but I will stress that the best way to deliver OTPT, physical therapy, optotherapy, is still remains, at least for children suffering from ADHD, is really a one-to-one -one face to face, not via screen. But then what happens is beggars can't be choosers. So if we have to do it, then I think fall back on a good uh, occupational therapy or a physical therapist person who might be able to run some of those sessions on a computer screen with the parents and try to we try to help our kids that way. That's the best we can do for now. Okay. Uh, the next question, Shantanuru, is that do you suggest professional help when you see kids getting into their own world and just not responding? Actually, I do. Actually, I do. Because if that's what happens, you know that there has been a serious problem. Now, whether the problem is that they are having a problem within their social group, be it bullying, be it isolation, or they are having some degree of uh, uh, psychological issues, be it uh, depression, and that we see in children as well, being feel, feeling of isolation, feeling of persecution. To be honest, parents may not be able to handle that. And it's extremely important at that point of time to actually accept and acknowledge that and access services. And these are the services that are there in various tertiary hospitals, it's there in ours. And a degree of professional proper help can turn around things so well, I think it would be criminal not to acknowledge it and help that kid come out of it by helping him access services that are there for the kids already. So Shantanu, are you suggesting that uh, when we seek this help, it can also be done online or is there, uh, if you can just tell us at what uh, point in time should we say, no, it can't be online. I have to go and meet the doctor now. I, I think if it's something that you're worried about on a psychological basis, I would suggest to really initially and certainly with the opening up at the moment, I would say it's essential to have a one-to-one -one physically meeting the doctor, at least for the first couple of sessions. Because I find it, I'll be honest, I, I mean, I do online consultations, but to be honest, it's, it's, it's a shadow of the real thing. It's very difficult to get a great idea. Uh, um, what you can do is listen to symptoms and then prescribe a medicine. That's not what being a doctor is. Being a doctor is much more. It's that kind of a little bit of a contact that you can go, get going when you're sitting across a child looking at him. And that's, that's what's really needed. That's even more important when you're talking about a child who has uh, either a learning difficulty or a psychosocial, psychological difficulty. It cannot be done across a screen. You really need to come in, sit across a table from a professional who can help, help the kid, help the parents much more. So basically what you're saying is the first two sessions at least go and meet the doctor. Absolutely. I think it's essential. I think the worry in people's uh, parents' minds could be that with the third day of coming, a lot of parents don't want to kind of expose them to a hospital environment. Maybe that's something that's bothering uh, them. Uh, so uh, correct. I can understand that. But I mean, it's something like this. These services really cannot be delivered through a screen very effectively. I got it. Uh, Another question, I think you've answered a part of it, but it says, Dr. Sen, practically, what do you think each one of us at home can do to keep our spirits and the kids' enthusiasm up when we ourselves are now finding it difficult to look at it objectively? Uh, I know it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, isn't it? I, I think what you do is that it's kind of realizing that how important uh, uh, family bonds and family values are. And the best way to get going is to get involved in family activities, whether it kind of sitting across a board game of some sort and playing it or uh, uh, make a cake together, something that involves everybody doing their own part, involving every member of the society, the children, the parents, the grandparents, doing sure. something together is what will actually build up those bonds and help you take, get so you out of it. So probably you're also answering the next question, which is uh, with absolutely limited access to the outdoors, how can children still be physically active? Uh, they just don't seem to love workouts and the indoors uh, have limited area for uninhibited movement. So obviously we are talking about places where the, the flat may be very small and there, is, uh, there are quite a few 
members staying within that and you're mm. not sending your kids out but what you said is right so maybe board games and stuff like that can be done uh, right. within the confines of their house uh, okay so i'll take the last question which is do you think parents kind of ignore their kids need for a healthy lifestyle because they are busy in their work even work from home doesn't really mean giving time to kids how should they take time out for that uh, i think it's a great question and that kind of uh, brings me in that how important it is to actually set aside some definite times to give to your kid give to your kids and it's kind of important to get that time to kids in kind of isolation so yes it's great to have a family time as we talk about talked about but it's also important to take that one child aside at some point and do something one to one and do the same with second child and the second child in the family and it's really important to take that time out i know parents are also in front of the screens because of work or whatever and once you finish the lure of catching up and binge watching that netflix is always there <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of it it is important it is important to take some time out and say let's switch off the television so that I'll log off that laptop computer completely tell me what you're doing are you reading a book which is the book that you enjoy or if you i mean if you've seen a movie tell me about it and just set that conversation going listen to your children talk to your children that's the best thing that you can do really true uh chandra thank you so much uh, for answering each of our questions with so much of uh, patience empathy objectivity um but before we finish this uh we now come to the last section of our chat uh and it's usually the fun round which is a rapid oh. 10 on 10 round yes okay and uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask you 10 questions okay and you can give a one word or a one sentence answer but don't know is not acceptable okay oh, this is scary uh, yeah, yeah no no, no, no this is fun me. this is fun this is fun okay so there are going to be 10 questions and rapid fire so are you ready shantanu here goes so here's the first one If you were not a doctor, what could you have been? Easy. So I would have been a pilot because then I could fly everywhere across the world. I love traveling. I love going to new places, new countries. Uh, I, I miss flights. I it's very easy. definitely fly to new corners of the world every day. I would love that. <laughs> Lovely. Second question: What's been your favorite binge-worthy show on Netflix during the pandemic? Oh, <laughs> why just Netflix? Anything, Amazon Prime, whatever. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, probably Narcos. Actually, I I got really uh, tied up with that. And um... absolutely, same here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is something I may know, mm. but your favorite single malt and why? <laughs> okay. Uh, to be honest, I'm a huge fan of the smoky single malts, and uh, Lafrak, ten year old, is something that uh, I just love it any time. <laughs> really, that's fantastic. Even Artbeg, you introduced me Art, to that. Artbeg, in fact, uh, there's 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 a new Artbeg uh, Ubledeal, which has just been voted the best oh. malt in the world, and I can't wait to see for that someday. Fabulous. <laughs> How do you keep fit? Oh God, tough. uh i try to get down to the gym at least five to six times a week if it, if i can uh tread wall uh, treadmill for a couple of hours um, otherwise uh, just like everybody else trying 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 to watch what i eat uh, the, the key word is trying to watch what i eat really <laughs> okay the fifth question what about practicing in what about practicing in uk do you miss the most here in india because you practice there for 10 years okay that's also kind of uh, easy where it may not be uh, okay so what happens in uh, when you're practicing in uk is that you have allocated work time and family time so which means if your work time is 10 to 5 you put your entire heart and soul in working those whatever 7 uh, or 8 hours and after that you kind of log off from work completely and you go out your mobile phone doesn't go off with the talking about patients it's all family time after that and you can go and chill out on a beach with full confidence that nobody's going to call you and i miss that i also really miss my saturdays and sundays which were sacrosanct work holidays that never happens in india so in india i think that's that's something that you are unable to kind of uh, uh, correct you know, 
Correct. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but I have to say in the same breath that uh, even though I've said that, uh, if it's an emergency, if a family calls me on a Sunday or something, I'm very happy to take Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have seen that firsthand as well. Uh, sixth question. If you were to return to UK, what would you miss most about working in India? Oh, uh, so many things. I, I think uh, one thing I, uh, okay, so, so I'll just say this. So when you're working in UK, a doctor's work is as important as an electrician's, is as important as a plumber's, is as important as a checkout girl's. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, yeah, so, so, so which means that everybody is important, but out here, the kind of love and affection that I get from my patients is amazing. It's seriously amazing. And that is something that if, in a, if, I, if I go back, I'll miss. So out there in patients, if, even if you put your heart and soul for a patient and try to get him better, his attitude would be right. He's done it. That's his job. Out here, the kind of appreciation you get from parents, from the children. I mean, I love kids and uh, I mean, some of those kids are kind of like friends of mine. That kind of one-to-one -one connection that I have with the kids here in India and with the parents is something that's not there in UK or US. The seventh question, music you like to listen to, but don't admit to it. Right. Ah. Is the quiet kind of music you listen to, but if anyone asks you what it is, you'll say, oh, it's something else. <laughs> okay, so I think I grew up with the generation that kind of listened to Pink Floyd and Dire Straits, to be honest. And you can say that, you can say, yeah, that's Pink Floyd or Dire Straits. Uh, what will raise eyebrows a little bit to when they say, he's listening to Cindy Lauper or Madonna. That's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a work of art that inspires you. Uh, thinking Man, Rodin. Beautiful like sculpture. Yes. I love it. That immediately kind of comes to my mind always. Uh, an amazing experience you've had in the midst of nature. Right. Uh, oh, that's a good question. That's a kind of... Uh, so that's probably would be that, uh, again, it's my favorite car journey that we take from Bombay going towards Nasik and crossing the hills of Bigatpuri, rolling down the windows and letting the whole clouds and the mist just come inside the car. Absolutely. There's Absolutely. no feeling like it. Just get out and just feel the clouds, the rain clouds going over you. Amazing. I love rains. I love rains. Anytime it rains, just... Get me out, get me drenched. That's the best thing ever. Perfect. And my last question, the first place you want to go to for a holiday with your family when you are able to? Right. Uh, it's so difficult to answer that. There are so many places I'm dying to go to. Uh, how do we answer that? Um, probably I would like to go back to UK once again and see and meet my old friends. But if it's somewhere that I'm going to go for a holiday that I'll really enjoy all out, one of my all-time favorite uh, holiday destinations are the, uh, the kind of uh, beaches in Thailand because I love the Thai food. I love the clear water. I think it's a fantastic. Sure. I've only been there once, but I can't wait to go back there. Uh, it should be opening up uh, soon because they're creating a, a, a bubble again. Phuket is one place that they're planning to open up uh, soon mm -hmm. for Indians as well. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, and with that, we come to the end of our talk for today. It was an absolute delight listening to uh, you today, Shantanu, and thank you for gracing our uh, chat show. I'm sure many of us parents and guardians will go away with a lot more knowledge about handling children. And you've indeed dispelled a lot of doubts today. So, we're going to sleep pretty easy tonight. Uh, and we wish you good health and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yobi, for having me. It's been a great experience. And thank you so much. Most welcome. And we'd love to have you on our show again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking to renowned pediatric oncologist, Dr. Shantanu Sen. Thank you for watching today's session brought to you by OWL. Stay tuned for more such meaningful sessions from uh, Outdoor Wilderness and Learning. Until the next episode, stay healthy, stay safe. This is your OWL host, Abhik Datta, wishing you goodbye. And...
till we meet again good night